here we go. I'm going to put us live over on YouTube. Okay, so that is working. Fantastic. Okay, great. Da, 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 da. Okay, no one is complaining in the background yet that the link is not working or something. So this is good news. Seems to be all okay. Well, it's uh, our absolute pleasure today to have Elena Bora with us from Italy. Um, again, one of the rising stars in the field. She, um, interestingly, has a background in chemistry yeah. and technology <laughs> <laughs> from the University of Parma. I got questions about how you link that up later on. Um, then you did a PhD in neuroscience in 2008, and you spent one year in Japan <laughs> as well, working with Catherine Rockland, which some of our uh, regular viewers might know, uh, because she um, was also part of the CNS comps that we did last year. Um, then you did two postdocs, one with Professor Lupino and one with Professor Isolati, mm -hmm. and moved on to a tenure track position in 2014, and are now associate professor. <laughs> uh again at the university of parma so far so good <laughs> fantastic yeah i, could, um, I couldn't leave parma <laughs> or parma couldn't let me go <laughs> clearly clearly <laughs> um well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, for everyone who's new to the CNS Talks, uh, the way it works is that we have a lovely speaker that will present her um, current work to us for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then Valentina, who you can also see here, will take over to do the Q&A session. Um, feel free to write your questions in the chat for everyone to see or directly at Valentina. Same for the people watching us over on YouTube. Um, you can write your questions in the, um, I think it's called the, the YouTube live chat over there. And I will bring the questions over here to our speaker. Well, that's enough from me. Over to you, Elena. <laughs> okay, so I share my screen. Okay. So thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really very excited to be here and to talk to this audience. So um, as you, okay, it is not, okay. <laughs> it's not working. Uh, okay, why it is not working, it was working. Um, yeah, we tried this. Let's try again. Okay. <laughs> Okay, can you see the, the present or the as a present? We can see it. Okay, okay. Uh, no, uh, yes, okay. yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so the general view of the organization of the neural substrate for a specific brain function has changed over the years. And the last uh, view, so the most accepted view now, is that uh, the cortical function are not localized in a specific area, but result from the co-joint activity of different regions, which are connected reciprocally through, of course, cortical connection, and work together as a specialized network, functionally specialized networks. To define a, special, a functionally specialized network, first we have to identify region, functional regions, and uh, to identify the specific function, functional contribution that that region gives to a specific function, of course, and network. And then, of course, we have to identify the existence of the connection between the, the different nodes. And uh, to do this, uh, of course, in, in non-human primates, we, ca we can use uh, neural tracers, so uh, retrograde or anterograde neural tracers. In humans, uh, we can use diffusion MRI and also functional connectivity for a functional correlation. Uh, it is known since the late 90s that, uh, that the cortical function, so the, the motor system, relies uh, on the existence uh, of connection between the parietal and the premotor cortex. 
Uh, this, there are parallel circuits uh, uh, linking different uh, parietal areas with different premotor areas. And one of these circuits is AIP F5 circuit, which plays a primary role in the in visual motor transformation for grasping. So the transformation of the informa visual information into a possible um, a potential motor action to interact with the object. So for example, a mug can be grasped can be, so be, and can interact with this object in different ways, depending on the shape of the, of the mug, but also on the uh, goal that we have or on uh, the other properties of the mug, like if it is a fillet or it is empty. And of course, uh, uh, depending on our behavioral, behavioral goal, so if we want to move it or if we want to drink. Uh, uh, so these two areas, F5 and AIP, have very similar functional properties. Uh, indeed, they are very strongly connected one another. Of course, the functions of the neurons depend on the connection of the neurons, and they, they share information because they have a very strong connectivity. And uh, the, the neurons in F5 have motor and visual properties, so our visual motor neurons. These neurons are active for, uh, money, for grasping of a different object and also have grip selectivity. Um, the, uh, in general, the, the, these uh, visual motor neurons are active uh, for the presentation of a, the, of a graspable object and then, of course, for, uh, for the grasping. But uh, some of these neurons uh, are also active just for the object, uh, object fixation. Um, a similar similar properties are also uh, present in the uh, in AIP. So from these uh, functional property properties, it has been proposed that in F five there is a pragmatic analysis of the object shape that leads to a, the activation of a potential motor act. And uh, which 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 motor act will be put into action depends on other signal, for example, the behavioral goal or some uh, abstract rule that we can apply to a specific task. In uh, area F5, there are also mirror neurons, uh, another, another type of visual motor neurons in which the motor, uh, the, so these neurons are active for, the, uh, for grasping, for example, for the hand object interaction and for the observation of the same action made by another person or a conspecific. Um, and these neurons are also, mirror neurons are also present in the AIP. So it has been proposed that in F5, there, is, uh, there are represent, representation of motor act. Uh, and in F5, there is the selection of the motor act to execute. Uh, F5 is just one synapse away from M1 or F1, so the primary motor cortex. So it, uh, F4, F5 and uh, the, it's, uh, it's, uh, the it circuits with, uh, with, F, with AIP is at the core of action, hand action selection. Actually, F5 is not a single area. Uh, it is divided into three different sectors. Two are located within the arcuate surface and one is on, this, on, the, on the cortical surface. Sorry, I take the, okay. No, sorry. I want to use uh, a laser. Uh, okay, can you see it? Okay. Uh, so two sectors are within the, the arcuate surface and one is uh, on the cortical uh, surface, uh, on the convexity cortex. And um, we defined these three sectors based on architectonics, but not just uh, with the Nissel staining that was the method used by Brodmann. But we use it also myelin, myelin, so the myel, myel architectonic, <laughs> and also immunoarchitectonic. Um, so you, uh, with immunoarchitectonic, we can identify uh, sub, um, subtype of cells like albumin, probalbumin positive neurons, or um, uh, SMI32 positive neurons. So each of each one of these uh, sector have a specific. Uh, architecture of the um, of the layers and um, and thus it has a specific microcircuitry within it uh, the more posterior part so f5p within the bank um, has a specific connections with the, the spinal cord so is a, is projecting to the spinal cord like uh, uh, similarly to m1 
uh, and is very strongly connected with F1, so with the primary motor cortex. Uh, in macaques, uh, uh, it is possible that this, uh, um, uh, the, the, the projection from F5 to the, to the spinal cord are responsible for the recovery of uh, the precision grip after M1 lesion. Indeed, in macaque, after M1 lesion, the animal can recover the precision grips and, and can recover dexterity, manual dexterity uh, after a period of training. And uh, uh, there is evidence for a role of the ventral premotor cortex in this recovery. So this corticospinal projection of F1, uh, of uh, F5, sorry, uh, is, could be effective um, in, uh, in activating uh, hand, uh, um, hand movement. Uh, another sector, the more rostral sector in the bank is F5A. F5A is, you see here, Injection in F5V um, result in connection with uh, uh, AAP, of course, but also with S2, which is, uh, which is connected with uh, all the uh, subregions of F5 and is connected with the prefrontal cortex. Uh, F5 uh, hosts mainly um, hand-related uh, neurons also some mouth-related neurons, but mainly hand-related neurons, and has uh, um, uh, the neurons in F5 uh, have also visual responses, object and action visual responses. Uh, the main characteristic of F5 is a strong prefrontal connectivity. You see that uh, labeling in the prefrontal cortex. So we hypothesize that this part of F5 is the sector, is the privileged sector uh, for the um, um, for it, for the um, for the integration of prefrontal uh, signals or, or signals related to the context uh, of the action to the rules or to the behavioral goal of the action into the AIP F5 circuit. The last uh, uh, sector of F5 F5C is more a mouth sector, so mouth related sector. Um, uh, and also this sector is very, very well connected with the prefrontal cortex uh, and with all the opercular, opercular region which are involved in the um, gustatory and, and uh, uh, other somatosensory uh, related functions. Um, AIP and F5, uh, so AIP and F5 are two very, um, um, very, con very well connected region but also have similar properties. The inactivation of F5 and AIP lead to very similar deficit. So uh, the inactivation with maximal uh, of uh, AIP and F5 um, result in uh, grasp, acquired grasping movement. So the, the monkey tries to uh, grasp the object, but it, it doesn't pre-shape uh, very well the, the hand and uh, can uh, interact with the object only after touching it. Um, the sorry, the um, uh, connection of AIP are shown here in this panel. AIP, of course, is connected with F5 and is connected with the prefrontal cortex. Uh, a further uh, interesting uh, uh, feature of the connectivity of AIP is the inferotemporal cortex. So AIP is in the parietal cortex. It receives information from the dorsal visual stream areas. So analyzing the object for, the, for its intrinsic properties, 3D uh, properties. But uh, AIP receives also information from the ventral visual stream areas, uh, analyzing uh, the object for, uh, the for its identity, okay? Um, since uh, AAP and F F5 have uh, a common projection to the prefrontal cortex, uh, we analyzed the, uh, the, the connectivity of this sector. And here you see an injection in the prefrontal cortex in a, re in a region called 12, in area 12. Uh, uh, and you can see that in this, after injection in this part of the prefrontal cortex, we have uh, labeling in F5, we have labeling in AIP, we have labeling in S2, in the hand region of S2, of the secondary sensory cortex, and also we have uh, um, labeling in the inferotemporal cortex. This part of the inferotemporal cortex is the same that is connected with AIP. So here we started to think about the network, because, you know, 
AIP and the five are connected. They are both connected, connected with the same prefrontal sector. And this prefrontal sector is connected with a sector of the temporal cortex that is the same that is connected with AAP. So we, are, so we started to see that uh, there are specific sectors involved in the and object interaction control. Uh, and um, uh, it was quite evident that are, there are uh, localized sectors like nodes of the network. Uh, this sector of the infratemporal cortex, so this, uh, this drawing is the uh, superior temporal sulcus, uh, the upper bank and the lower bank. So here we are in the infratemporal cortex uh, within the bank, okay, uh, rostral to the, to the fundus of the superior temporal sulcus. Uh, this sector is um, uh, processing information uh, about uh, uh, object but also 3D shapes, material properties of the object, what uh, Urban and his colleagues have called the real world entities. Uh, object, but also hands, a part of the body, uh, and is also active for action observation so, and interacting with objects. Uh, interestingly, uh, the um, neurons uh, in the infratemporal cortex uh, uh, have um, uh, 3D shape selectivity at a latency uh, that is uh, longer than uh, in AIP. So the inf visual information arrives first in, a in AIP, and then AIP can be modulated by the information coming from the ventral visual stream. So the visomotor transformation for grasping is a very fast and automatic uh, um, uh, process, which can be then uh, influenced by the information coming from the ventral visual stream. Uh, we have just one injection in the inferior temporal cortex that is very interesting. This, in, this uh, injection um, resulted into labeling outside the, inf the temporal cortex in S2, in area 12, in AAP, and a little bit also in a five. We were very sur very surprised about this uh, this case, and uh, unfortunately, it's not easy to inject in the infratemporal cortex. So uh, this is the the only case that we have. But actually, outside of the temporal cortex, uh, we observe only the nodes of our network that are labeled. Actually, there is also FIA, FIA, and we never, we have never seen a projection to the temporal cortex injecting F5A. But it is possible that some labeling uh, so, or some connection are also direct uh, with the temporal cortex. So um, we start to build up our uh, our network with the uh, premotor and para rostral parietal nodes of the network. Uh, the prefrontal, uh, ventrolateral prefrontal node, and with the infratemporal cortex. To this uh, circle, we have uh, also to add uh, S2, because S2 is always uh, labeled after prefrontal, um, premotor, uh, and uh, um, parietal uh, injections. Um, actually, the prefrontal cortex uh, um, involved in the network is not only area 12, but also area 46. Uh, these are two injections in area 46, with, uh, which are uh, both uh, um, which both show labeling in F5A, uh, in AIP, in S2. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, both area. This is the pre the the, pre the principal sulcus. And this is the arcuate sulcus. That this is the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex that have been recorded. So area 46 is here. Area 12 is here. Uh, have been recorded by, by our colleagues and uh, with the same task that was used to study F5 and AAP. And in this sector, again, we have neurons very which have uh, very similar properties uh, with respect to F5 and AAP. So are active during grasping, some have grip selectivity, and some, of course, are modulated by cue or presentation. Of course, we are in the prefrontal cortex, so probably there are um, there are other types of uh, uh, properties of these, new, uh, these neurons, but uh, for sure there, there are movement related neurons uh, and object related neurons, like in F5. Um, actually, in the prefrontal cortex, there is a sector uh, of the area 46 and area 12, which is uh, um, processing information uh, on 
and uh, object interaction uh, in execution and in observation. So uh, both when the, ma the macaque is uh, performing the action and when it observes the action made by a conspecific or another person. So in the prefrontal cortex, the more caudal part is uh, um, uh, receive information from the motor system and uh, the operation that, so the kind of information processing that the prefrontal cortex do in this part is for motor control. This is very, very clear from the, from the connectivity. So we can build, we can put together all this uh, information and we uh, have our lateral grasping network. Uh, you see that uh, the, the different node, parietal node here, we, you also see PFG is another region that is very well connected with, uh, with area F5 and with uh, the other nodes of the network. I, I don't analyze all the, the nodes because they are a little bit more, but uh, the main nodes, uh, um, uh, I, I, let's say, uh, introduced to you the main nodes. Um, so the, at the center of this circuit, there is the connectivity uh, with, uh, of uh, AAP with F5. And um, in, uh, you can see from this picture that the, the, the nodes of this network are connected from a, let's say, dorsal, temporal, parietal, frontal pathway. And also the temporal cortex is connected with the prefrontal cortex with a ventral temporal frontal pathway. And when uh, uh, we observe an object that is uh, graspable with it, uh, in, during action selection, the object in principle properties of the, uh, of the object uh, are analyzed in the dorsal stream and then uh, um, are processed in the, in the F5 AIP circuit for uh, visomotor transformation. Uh, then object identity and the visual coding of action uh, uh, taking place in the inferotemporal cortex can modulate the activation of this circuit and can uh, influence selection process, uh, action selection process. Of course, from the prefrontal cortex, information about goals and rules, uh, as well as memory related information, can, uh, can of course uh, uh, be uh, used for action selection, for, this, uh, for selecting the, co the correct uh, action to, to, be, to, to execute. And information about uh, from coming from S2 can uh, be related uh, um, to the haptic coding of an object. And, and of course, when the action uh, has been uh, uh, selected and is put into action through the, um, uh, thanks to the connection of F5 to, with F1, with M1, with the primary motor cortex, of course, the information coming from the hand, so the sensory feedback of, uh, during the action, again, enters into the, the circuit and is uh, uh, into this network and is again uh, used uh, for uh, uh, correcting the action or for building up uh, new representations. Um, the insula, there is a sector of the insula which is uh, uh, always labeled after injection in all our nodes of the network. And we hypothesize that this part of the insula is important for uh, 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 the quality of the action based on the internal state. Um, and uh, of course, when we uh, select an action, these, new, these uh, nodes are active and uh, they are uh, talking each other. But also when we uh, search, for example, for the key in our pocket uh, or for uh, something in our bag, we use uh, um, uh, tactile object recognition. All these nodes are active also in this kind of task. So this network is a grasping network, but is also a tactile object recognition network. So the flow of information, the information uh, uh, shared by these nodes is not only for uh, selecting and um, uh, executing grasping. Indeed, in all these nodes, we also have action observation um, uh, signals, action observation activity. So this is also an action observation network. So this network, the, the nodes of it, uh, the network is there is anatomy. And of course the function of these nodes uh, are uh, several functions, not just one. 
So what is a functionally specialized network? Of course, it's an interpretation, okay? It's a functional interpretation of anatomy. And how can we, uh, and uh, how we can decide to put inside the network a region or not? Uh, of course, as I showed you, um, uh, it is for us. It was very important to uh, when so when you look the the, um, the, the connection outside, uh, for example, the, the region that you injected. So if we inject in the prefrontal cortex, we have high prefrontal connectivity. But outside the prefrontal cortex, what do we have? And um, for area forty six and for area twelve, we have only a five and AAP and infratemporal cortex and so on. So the um, Long range connectivity are for us were very important to define what was in and what was out. But actually, uh, each one of these nodes is connected also with other region, especially with local um, uh, uh, with the local cortex, so with the nearby uh, areas. Not so much, but of course the, there is also local connectivity. So actually, um, we can also add. Uh, other region to this network, for example, F6. Uh, F6 uh, is a, a pre-SMA. Uh, Pre-SMA is very important to start uh, um, uh, to, to give the onset of the movement. Uh, and actually, also the electrophysiological studies have uh, highlighted this role also for grasping. Uh, but we could also link our grasping network that is called the lateral because uh, we also have other more dorsal region which are um, uh, processing hand related information. These dorsal region uh, are actually well connected one another uh, and are D6, A, F2 and uh, the dorsal uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, for example, F46 uh, dorsal. Uh, these dorsal uh, areas uh, tend to be more connected uh, one another with respect to the ventral um, uh, areas of the lateral grasping network. But for sure, there are interconnections be between these two, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, are two separate network in terms of uh, the um, preference of the connectivity. Uh, the lateral grasping network uh, uh, has also subcortical targets. Uh, very, very briefly, we analyze, I show you which um, which are these uh, targets. Um, AAP, so the, the parietal, premotor, and prefrontal uh, nodes of the network sense convergent projection to the superior colliculus. Uh, and the, the hypothesis for this projection is uh, that the superior colliculus can uh, remap uh, the space. Uh, um, uh, this, um, it, it hosts the saliency map of the space uh, uh, and remap the space uh, based on behavioral goals and so the, the action goals. Uh, and also can be very important for um, uh, planning the eye movement. So when we grasp, first we go with the eyes and then we, we go with the hand. So this kind of behavior uh, is very important for action execution. And probably this kind of, this projection are involved in, in these processes. Another uh, common target in subcortical target is the putamen. There are two sectors, two parts of the putamen that in which the, the, the areas of the lateral grasping network send convergent projection. This uh, is um, interesting because it, it seems that in the basal ganglia, there are uh, input channel for the lateral grasping network for these set of areas. Um, okay, but uh, may, probably you are, uh, you are, uh, interested to know if there is something similar in the human brain, of course. Actually, uh, we can ask the question in this way, is it possible to define a similar anatomical and functional uh, network in the brain? Anatomical and functional sector connected one another, okay? So, um, is, it is very easy to, uh, to think in this way. So, okay, you see that the, in, at the top, there are the two maps uh, by Brodmann, macaque and humans. Uh, and it's very uh, common to, to think about one Brodmann area in one brain and think that is similar, homologous maybe to the other, 
to the one to the same area with the same number in the in the macaque brain. But of course, you know that is much more complex. Uh, so if we want to um, uh, consider homologies, uh, to, to, to consider an area homologous in the macaque and in the human, we have to, to think that it should derive from a common primate ancestor. And then this area evolved differently in humans and macaques. Um, so, Homologies are difficult to, to define. Uh, we can suggest homologies. We cannot define homologies. Actually, we can uh, find uh, similar, similar areas, areas with similar properties, areas with uh, um, or similar function and similar connection. Okay. So it's known since uh, the first study studies with the fMRI that uh, grasping, so object-oriented uh, um, actions, uh, hand actions, uh, activate two sectors, one in the parietal cortex and one in the premotor cortex. The one in the parietal cortex uh, has been studied a lot, and uh, uh, we have a region that now is called H human AIP. So it has a lot of similarities with the macaque AIP. Well, the, the spot in the, um, in the premotor cortex, um, so uh, during grasping, the premotor cortex is active, the ventral premotor cortex, and uh, this activation could be more in area six or more in area 44. So that is a, a part of the Broca area. So the, um, this activation is more uh, difficult to identify, uh, is more difficult to attribute to a specific area, okay? Also AIP is a functional area, is not an architectonic area. Uh, both these two uh, regions, so rostral parietal and ventral premotor are also active during observation of action. So they could host mirror neurons. Uh, a very interesting study was done in, by the group of Gabriella Cherry, and they um, um, made a map of the ventral premotor cortex based on um, stimulation, electrical stimulation of patients uh, during surgery. Uh, and what they found is that in front, so in the precentral gyrus, uh, more rostrally, we have a region with higher uh, latencies, uh, so which, in which stimulation evoke movements with higher latencies uh, and higher intensity with respect to the more caudal, um, caudal sites. And in the dorsal part, we, uh, they could evoke uh, uh, for hand movement, uh, more laterally, uh, auto hand movement, and again, more laterally, where the uh, green spots are, uh, only mouth uh, or face movement. So this organization is actually the same organization that we have in a five. Okay, this is uh, interesting because we can start from here to think about possible correspondence, a possible correspondence with the macaque brain. And this sector have also different uh, uh, behavior. So the, the stimulation in this sector have uh, differently affect a movement while it is uh, performed. Again, in the, in the surgery room, the, the patient is stimulated while it is uh, his uh, or she is performing a, a hand object interaction uh, movement. Um, and the stimulation of some part of the, the premotor cortex lead to a motor unit uh, recruitment while other uh, stimulation in other parts of the uh, premotor cortex lead to a suppression of the motor, uh, the recruitment of the motor units. So this again suggests that in the premotor cortex, there are different functional sectors, but actually for um, site architectonics is area six, okay? Um, actually, it's not so, <laughs> okay, I simplified a little bit because I, in 2010, Amos and his group, they, um, her group, sorry, uh, they, um, um, pro they uh, made this, uh, this map of the Broca area, of the Broca region, actually of area 6, area 44, and area 45. Uh, and they, uh, you, you can see that um, this map is made, uh, includes several regions, like 44 is divided into D and B, and also area 6 is subdivided into different, the ventral part of area 6 is subdivided into different areas. This map is made, is uh, based on uh, receptor architectonics, so the distribution of the receptors for the different uh, um, 
the different neurotransmitters, and they um, suggest a possible that the possible homologue of F5 is this region, this ventral region. So actually, it, this means that uh, again, that uh, area six is, is not uh, is not uh, all the same. So we have different anatomical and functional region. We have to match these two studies to understand if we have a, something like a five in the human brain. Um, to uh, go back to the network idea, uh, the parietal cortex, uh, uh, of course, the lesion of the parietal cortex and lesion of the premotor cortex lead, lead to apraxia, a different type of apraxia. Um, so um, uh, the, the rostral parietal cortex is involved in hand uh, action control, in hand action planning, not only AFP, but also a region which is uh, uh, in, the, in the rostral supramarginal gyrus, which is PFT, which is has been suggested by Casper and colleagues, uh, based on basically on uh, uh, tractography or the MRI um, data. Uh, it has been proposed to be the uh, corresponding region of PFG. So that is one of our uh, nodes of the lateral grasping network. In the parietal cortex, also um, uh, we also have in the macaque we have RS2. Um, the hand region of S2 could be uh, corresponding to uh, OP4 and OP1, two oper um, parietal opercular regions involved in uh, haptic coding of object, uh, in uh, grasping and uh, object recognition through uh, through um, manipulation. Um, and I, I, I'm not entering too much into details because there are a lot of uh, studies uh, supporting this uh, view. Uh, of course, uh, the connection, the connection uh, uh, from the parietal, so the rostral parietal uh, and the percular parietal and uh, the premotor cortex uh, run within uh, the third branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, which uh, is known to, uh, to be uh, well conserved uh, between um, uh, the macaques and humans. So there are corresponding uh, fasciculi uh, that can be um, referred to as uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus, the first branch, the second branch, and third branch. Uh, actually, this connection between um, uh, the connection uh, between AIP and F5 and the run run within the third branch of the superlongitudinal fasciculus. Um, okay, but uh, what about the other nodes? The temporal cortex, uh, the infratemporal cortex of the macaque, has been proposed to be corresponding homologue of um, the lateral occipital complex. Uh, there are very interesting functional, um, functional studies uh, um, we, in which uh, the uh, lateral occipital, the activity in the lateral occipital complex is uh, um, modulated by um, uh, the, the type of grip, uh, the type of action that has been, uh, should be done during the planning, but also the functional connectivity between LOC and AIP and PMP is, uh, um, is modulated by the task. For example, when pictorial cues are used, the, this connectivity uh, uh, is increased. And uh, the connectivity of, uh, okay, the LOC is also a very interesting uh, um, properties, uh, the representation uh, of visual objects. So this uh, is, of course, a visual, uh, mainly visual areas, a visual area. Um, the visual object uh, um, representation uh, is influenced by the uh, action related the properties of the object. So all the objects that are used with the hand cluster together and uh, the, uh, the, those that are used with, with the face cluster together uh, and so on. Uh, the connectivity of the, 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 the LOC with the parietal cortex uh, uh, could, uh, um, uh, so the, the, this connectivity is, uh, is possible thanks to the middle of the fasciculus and the, the ELF. Um, and, and this connectivity, the temporal parietal connectivity in humans is much, uh, much more, uh, much richer uh, with respect to the, the one that we observe in the macaque. Um, and what about the prefrontal cortex? The prefrontal cortex, uh, the uh, middle frontal gyrus, is uh, um, is considered homologous to the um, uh, to area forty six, uh, based on architecture, basically. 
but um, is, there are very interesting studies uh, showing that uh, the MFG, the, for example, the um, TMS, so the, the uh, temporary inactivation of um, the middle frontal gyrus, uh, um, uh, modulate the excitability of M1. So this part of the prefrontal cortex uh, is somehow uh, uh, con influenced, connected, or um, uh, has an output uh, uh, on the premotor cortex and motor cortex. And uh, so the middle frontal gyrus uh, could be uh, our node in the prefrontal cortex for, uh, for action, uh, for object-oriented uh, end action. Um, and uh, the connectivity uh, is, uh, um, this sector, the prefrontal cortex is connected with the parietal cortex through this uh, SLF uh, uh, two and three, second and third branch, sorry. And also it has the middle frontal gyrus can be connected with the premotor cortex, uh, thanks to the, the existence of a frontal inferior longitudinal tract, and is also connected with the infratemporal cortex, uh, um, uh, thanks to the uh, arcuit fasciculus and also the uh, IFOF. One is the dorsal, um, part, dorsal bundle and another is the ventral bundle. Uh, okay. Uh, the insula, uh, basically our hypothesis uh, on the role of the insula in the lateral grasping network is mainly based on the human studies in which uh, we, know, we know that uh, there is a, set, a part of the insula which is uh, uh, involved in the, um, um, uh, in the action observation, uh, in the coding action observation performed with different, uh, uh, let's say, vitality forms, so gently or, or rudely, so with different uh, um, uh, emotional states, let's say. Um, so this part of this the ins a sector of the insula could be also uh, part of the lateral grasping network in humans, uh, also thanks to the connectivity of the insula with the premotor and the uh, prefrontal cortex. So, Putting all together these things that I, <laughs> uh, uh, let's say, I hope uh, um, explain it to you. Um, in the monkey, we have uh, uh, our uh, network of areas connected through uh, temporal, parietal, frontal, dorsal pathway, and ventral pathways, uh, temporal, frontal, ventral pathways. And we can um, identify functional regions uh, which, for which there is evidence for uh, um, some kind of uh, similarities uh, uh, with the uh, macaque uh, areas. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, view uh, builds on the idea that the um, sensory motor uh, organization of the human brain is very similar to that dark brain, of course, we are not, uh, let's say, uh, putting this uh, uh, network uh, 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 on the human brain without previous knowledge, of course. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, um, the areas of the human brain that we identify uh, to be possible uh, nodes of a possible lateral grasping network have also different functions. They are not only involved in hand-object interactions, uh, but they are also involved in more human-specific uh, uh, function like tool use or imitation learning. But actually the network, as I showed you in the macaque, is not only for grasping, is also for uh, the, the information in these areas um, are not limited to uh, planning and executing grasping. Um, and, and thus in the human brain, uh, of course, this novel function uh, could have evolved from the adaptation of the existing mechanism. And, um, uh, and we can uh, hypothesize that this higher order function can be, um, uh, can, can originate from the, the uh, simpler mechanism present also in the macaque brain. And I want to thank my colleagues. I think I, uh, I, I'm on time, more or less, I hope, maybe a little bit late. Um, Marzio Gervella, Stefano Rozzi, Rozzi and Giuseppe Luppino, which uh, basically are the anatomy group of Barman. And thank you for uh, your attention.
Thank you so much, Elena. Very, very interesting presentation. And um, I will take advantage of my role of Q&A host <laughs> to shoot the first question to break the, the ice. Um, so first question. Uh, do you is there a, a degree of uh, lat lateralization uh, of the of the grasping network? Um, in particular, is it uh, active similarly for uh, right hand actions, uh, right hand uh, uh, grasping actions, and left hand grasping actions? And also, do macaques have uh, a dominant hand? Uh, yeah. <laughs> A single, okay, thank you for your question. Very interesting, actually. Uh, the macaque, uh, usually they prefer to use each macaque, uh, prefer to use a hand, left or right, but as a population, they don't have a predominant, uh, a predominant hand use. So they can be right. Uh, each monkey can, pre can use preferentially left or right, but there is not a general rule. And there's also a bit um, uh, somehow, strange because they are social animals and so there are some uh, hypotheses for this uh, uh, absence of uh, uh, um, laterality of uh, the use of the hand and so since uh, in the macaques uh, we don't have uh, um, laterality, they are the macaques are not uh, they don't prefer to use one hand so we can uh, actually um, train the monkey to use the left or, or the right uh, basically they do the same. Um, we don't know if there is a lateralization of the lateral grasping network in the macaque. And in humans, um, this is very interesting because, you know, uh, broke, it's, uh, the activation in the premotor cortex uh, uh, involves also the Broca area. Uh, so, uh, but humans, uh, usually they are right handers, especially in, in the in the studies, uh, so uh, it, it it would be very interesting to to analyze this network uh, in the humans and uh, more specifically in right handers and left handers to see whether it is uh, lateralized or not, or if some of these activations are lateralized uh, and some maybe not. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Um... Well, actually, in humans, there are a few studies that uh, say that um, it's uh, activated uh, similarly, but with uh, um, degrees of specialization for uh, the dominant hand uh, who, uh, for instance, recruits both um, left and right hemispheres network because it's dominant. That's why I was yeah. I was wondering whether this. Yeah, this kind I, of I don't know if. Uh, OK. Um... The, the, the network is there, uh, is our interpret functional interpretation that can be different. So probably uh, for sure in the left hemisphere, we have uh, a lateral grasping network, but uh, I, I'm not sure that in the, uh, in the right hemisphere, this network is doing something different, completely different. So uh, I don't know, we should study with mm -hmm. very, uh, clear hypothesis and uh, it could be very interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering also uh, what's the adven evolutionary advantage of having a uh, uh, hand uh, um, preference? Uh, yes. Uh, I guess <laughs> it's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I, I read a book uh, about um, made by, uh, written by Giorgio Vallorti Garrett is very interesting about on this topic. And uh, oh, you, can, you can share it on the chat, maybe I will uh, love to have a look. Oh, yes, yes. I, I don't, um, in this moment, I don't remember the title, but I will oh, we, can, we can do it after. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a, so laterality is something not so special about humans. So, you know, is uh, uh, there are other animals uh, the, that show this uh, lateralization. So, um, is is a is an interesting interesting issue, and I don't have a, so about the the network. So we tried to see if there was a difference in the left and right uh, hemisphere uh, in terms of connectivity, uh, but uh, the um, so when we do neural tracer, we uh, usually make few injections. Uh, so our numbers are very uh, small, and so if we have four injection or five injection in the prefrontal cortex and maybe 
two are in the uh, left hemisphere, but then the other two are in the right, but then they are not exactly in the same position. So we cannot compare uh, with the tracers. Of course, it's something that we can do with uh, uh, tractography, for example. Um, is something that could be done and maybe uh, something is different. I, I think that we uh, also observed some differences, but mm -hmm. we were not so, so sure, so we didn't describe them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's a methodological limit of uh, uh -huh. interaction. I see. Thank you. Um, so, Proud, any question from our uh, uh, Zoom viewers? I don't see you. Oh, yeah, Steffi, go on. Thank you. If there's no one else, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in. I have like a thousand questions <laughs> for you. <laughs> I'm going to try to uh, make them happen in the, in the time that we have. Um, so as we're talking about the method and the numbers at the moment, um, I was wondering what kind of data you do have in your macaque. So you, for example, mentioned that with tractography, you could be looking at that. Is that data available or would that need to be okay. collected? Uh, so we have um, tractography of our macaques because before injecting the tracer, we, we do some scanning. But um, since, so we don't, we don't have a, co a strict collaboration with the uh, uh, people doing uh, imaging. We have a collaboration with this, uh, with the, with this uh, seven Tesla uh, machine, the people of, no, with the, with the machine, of course, with the people working in this place, uh, they use the seven Tesla. Um, so we, we uh, and we are starting and struggling to have a good uh, uh, setup to have good uh, data. So we have the photography, also the, the, the diffusion, uh, but the quality is, is at the moment is not is not enough. Is not is 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 not enough. So uh, the last one that we did, so the last the tractography that we did, probably uh, they start to be okay, not not great. So you know to compare tracers with this not very good data is not is not nice, but. Uh, it, one of our goal is to have also a very good tractography to um, to do nice comparison and uh, yes, but it, it's just the uh, you know uh, funding problems and uh, time problem. Uh, it's not scientific problem. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So that is fixable, <laughs> but. Um... I hate to disappoint you. We'll probably always be disappointed by the quality of the reconstructions you can see, given that you do tracing. <laughs> so it's yeah. always going to be a lot more brutal than what you're used to. Yeah. Um, but exciting. I'm looking forward to that work once the hurdles are overcome. <laughs> Actually, the last two, uh, the last two uh, acquisitions that we did uh, um, were okay. No, not, not, very, not perfect, but yeah. Uh, we can work on them, and we injected the in the putamen, so we uh, we have data on the cortical um, cortical striatal uh, projection. Uh, uh, that is something that with the, the tractography in macaques uh, is not so clear. So we hope to 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 help uh, to define something. Um, Amazing. But, yeah. Yeah, it is very preliminary and I'm not sure that, so we have first to check very well the quality of the data. <laughs> of course, of course. It's, it's one of my mantras, always look at the quality of your data. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna keep going unless someone from the audience is interrupting me at some point. <laughs> um, so with the tracing, you mentioned that some areas are harder to inject than others and that you can't actually cover the full um, brain, and I was wondering which areas are difficult um, and why. Um, uh, yeah, is since long time we want to inject S two, the, the secondary somatosensory area, uh, and this difficult because uh, for surgical reasons, because you, we, usually, usually we we make a very small craniotomy and then we inject. And it's very easy to to um, do craniotomy in the for on above the frontal and parietal cortex, but it's much harder if you go more laterally. 
So it is possible to access this region uh, uh, doors from dorsal, so uh, injecting with the needle, um, uh, approaching from vertically. But of course, it's very easy to to um, to have a leakage, for example, of the of the tracers, uh, or to uh, to uh, use a wrong angle, just a little bit uh, uh, wrong, but then you reach another region. So uh, we don't have a, a navigation system in the surgery room. So we cannot check uh, directly where we are when we inject. So we have to rely on calculations. On, um, so even if the, cal the, the, the measures are made on, uh, on the um, MRI of the animal, uh, of course, it's, it's difficult. It's just for surgical reason. But uh, so, and, and for example, S2 is, uh, is something like uh, our uh, mirage <laughs> because we cannot inject. We tried once in, in one animal and we had not interest. So we injected in the white matter in one, uh, one injection was in the white matter and the other one didn't uh, uh, transport because sometimes it happens with the traces that the trace, uh, you know, we don't know why, but they don't try, they are not transported. Uh, so it happens and um, so it's, it's S2 and the infratemporal cortex is difficult. And you see that there are very few um, uh, in the literature, very few um, injection were made in this uh, part of the cortex. So uh, if you check the literature, it's full of injection in, a, in the primary motor cortex, in the parietal cortex, uh, in the premotor cortex, uh, but very, very few, very, in very, very few studies, uh, the, the temporary cortex uh, has been uh, injected because it's surgically difficult. Great. I see my question marathon was interrupted by Leah, so I'm going to hand over. Yeah, I wasn't scared by the marathon. I will jump in for one question. Um, no, no, I just want to say that I really love this slide, the one where you show the pie chart with the multifunctionality of each region. And um, I was thinking if there is a way to investigate neuroplasticity in the grasping network, since we have this uh, distribution, uh, not like uh, yeah, clear localization. Yeah, um, probably with, uh, uh, with the tractography, maybe, I don't know, you should tell me, <laughs> or with um, functional connectivity, probably, uh, we could uh, see. But um, of course, with tracers, we cannot mm, study plasticity uh, because, of course, we have to um, uh, we have to have the, the brain on the on the slide. So uh, uh, the other possibility, uh, you know, that now in the in, an, in the um, anatomy world, uh, uh, there are viruses, so uh, we can use viruses to modulate the. Um, the functioning of specific uh, uh, connection. But uh, this is, uh, so the anatomy in rodents now is done like this with viruses, but in macaques, uh, it is more difficult now. So there are groups uh, trying to push a little bit uh, these methods, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's not easy now to, to, probably in the future, we will, we will be able to study these uh, circuits uh, thanks to the um, viral approach, uh, and we could maybe we could also study the, um, the plasticity. But uh, yes, up to now probably we should rely on uh, uh, MRI methods, so MRI-based methods. Okay, thank you. Really, I didn't know about right. this viral uh, way method. Oh. Really, thank you. Uh, before uh, continuing the marathon <laughs> question, marathon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to jump in and um, uh, ask a question that I, I was actually it was in my mind since the beginning of the um, of the presentation. And then you uh, mentioned it toward the end that uh, the network is not only active during grasping, but also uh, to other kind of movements. And uh, in fact, at the beginning, my question was, is it active also during mimicking? The uh, grasping okay, uh, not other type of so always hand related and mm. movement. Okay, so is a is a is a uh, is an act. It, so all these areas uh, control 
hand-object interaction. So distal movement, not, not the reaching part probably, but more the distal part. So the, the finger movement uh, on the object. Or, um, yes, probably also for, for mimicking, for, for uh, um, imagination of movement. Of course, we cannot study this in the monkeys because uh, we, we are not sure if they are uh, imagining if, if they, what they are thinking. But uh, in humans, uh, 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 so the, the parietal and premotor nodes of the network are active also for um, for uh, um, uh, mimicking and also uh, for real style of of, um, uh, of actions, uh, um, um, mental real, of course. Uh, so um, in this this in these uh, areas, uh, these areas share uh, information. Um, so when uh, it, there is a planning of the action, uh, probably the information is in one direction. And okay. when there is the execution, the incoming information is mainly from the somatosensory uh, cortex and is shared to the other ones. Uh, then, so and probably also in different uh, uh, part of the task, like uh, um, if you imagine the monkey performing the, the, the task, so uh, it, uh, it, so the monkey received the cue uh, and then the instruction and then the, the go signal. In uh, all these uh, uh, phases of the task, uh, the information flow can can uh, start from one node to the other and then from another node to the other nodes. And something so this approach. Uh, has been studied. Uh, so our colleagues uh, that uh, record from some of these areas like F5, AIP, but also F6 uh, since a long time, they put together uh, um, recently uh, data uh, from recording in, this, in different areas. And they saw something like this. So in, a, in one phase of the, of the um, of the task, uh, the information is first uh, arrives in AIP and then is shared uh, with the uh, um, F5 and then the, the F6, for example. In other phases of the uh, of the task is F6 that it gives the go signal to the other to the other areas through F5 and AIP. Uh, so um, we and I also made the um, example of the tactile object recognition. Mm -hmm. So if I have to recognize an object in my pocket, I use the movement and the incoming uh, information from S2 to uh, recall the, uh, uh, the, the image of the mental image of the object and recognize the identity of the object. If I have two different objects, very similar, I use the, the the tactile, sorry, sorry, the, the texture of the object to uh, to identify the object. Um, so uh, this information, uh, some of the sensory motor information about the hand, uh, are shared in this network uh, uh, among the, other, the the various nodes. And of course, the visual information is very interesting because it is about the object, but is also about the action itself, my action. First and also others, the action of the others. Uh, so this kind, this visual information uh, about the description of my own action and the action of the other is very interesting, of course, for a social uh, aspect. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the social movement. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it, uh, the activation includes also the, the social movement. Yeah. Um, and I also have a follow-up curiosity, and then the floor will be yours, <laughs> Steffi. <laughs> um, on the matter of how is uh, a behavioral task um, built for, uh, for macaques, uh, more specifically, um, is the uh, planning of the movement part, uh, the recognition of the object part, uh, um, hypothesized or um, seen through the various stages of the of the uh, reaching movement, or um, is it possible to do um, to plan uh, control tasks for for controlling also high mm -hmm. level? Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, you mean so you mean when re object recognition? So. For in a task of object recognition, or uh... no, for in a in a simple mm. 
Okay. That's the right. task. Yeah. Um, so the activation of, uh, for instance, the activation of the prefrontal cortex uh, um, suggests that um, uh, there is a, uh, the planning for the planning of the movement information going to uh, the promoter, the um, uh, motor cortex. And how is the planning of the movement controlled in a task with macaques? It's yeah. just a curiosity because yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. Never yes, yes, yes. I understand. I want uh, to be specific because macaques, it, yes. Of course, you can you can uh, study different aspects of um, planning. So, for example, if you give to the uh, if the monkey doesn't know if she has to make the movement or not, so is in go no go task. Uh, first, they use you, you give to the monkey a cue that the task so the the, the task is uh, starting, but she does she or okay it does, the monkey doesn't know if which which of the two condition will be, so go or no go. Mm -hmm. So first uh, you, probably it is planning both, okay? Then if it received the, uh, the go queue is planning the action. If it, uh, uh, the monkey received the no go queue is no more planning the action. So if you, um, in this way, you know uh, if she is planning, if she or if he is planning or not. Um, and the same for, for the object selectivity. Uh, for the object selectivity, you use different objects and you, say, you see whether the neurons uh, is selective more for one object or the other. So you can uh, use, con yeah, you control the activity of the, uh, of the neurons for one uh, object uh, with respect to the other. Um, uh, so you can, uh, design a task to, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, um, hypothesize what is in the main, in the in the monkey brain, of course, but it should be at, so a, a, a plausible very task for very, a monkey. Yeah, but yeah. actually, monkey uh, monkeys are able to do very very complex tasks. So um, and uh, so. I think that is possible to study several. It, it, it's very important to design it very well, but um, it can uh, you can have a lot of uh, um, response to this kind of task, mm -hmm. and you can also use the. Uh, okay, this is another this is another thing. So you can you can decode from the activity of the neurons in a specific also in some specific. Uh, uh, the part of the of the of the task um, to see whether there is again information that you you didn't plan to have, but yeah, this is another story. No, no, <laughs> no. I, complex. So the, the taking advantage of the temporality of the task and uh, yeah, and yes, the yes. Recording. Okay, that, that's very interesting for me. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Steffi. Do you have any more questions? <laughs> I do have many more questions, but I'm very aware of the time. So what I suggest we do is we release everyone else. And then, Elena, if you have more time, I'm happy yeah. to bombard you. Or <laughs> we just have a separate meeting. About yes, for sure. I'm very happy to. <laughs> Fantastic. So in that case, um, thanks everyone over on YouTube. Thank you all for joining us here uh, on Zoom. Um, we see you for the next CNS talks, and we actually have a double bill next month. Um, so we have Andre Marken from the Dundas Institute talking about predictive clinical neuroscience. And then we have our long planned COVID-19 special, COVID and the brain, where we have two speakers from the clinical arena um, joining us. So do join us for the double bill next month. And thank you for being here today. Uh, for those of you who want to hang back and ask more questions, feel free to do so. <laughs> Everyone else have